The United Nations General Assembly was the scene of a celebration in 2015, when 193 member countries adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, a unanimous commitment to end poverty, fight inequality, and tackle climate change. We need action from everyone, everywhere. 17 Sustainable Development Goals are our guide. They are a to-do list for people and planet and the blueprint for success. The SDGs are an agenda to balance human prosperity with protecting the planet. Imagine there's no countries. UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador Shakira asked global leaders to imagine a world where we achieve the goals by 2030. While fellow UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador Angelique Kijo underscored a focus on Africa and developing countries. But the universal agenda is important to all nations, as leaders from developed countries also pledged to make the goals a reality. Poverty, growing inequality exists in all of our nations, and all of our nations have work to do, and that includes here in the United States. And that's why today I am committing the United States to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals build on the success of another 15-year plan. Created in the year 2000, the Millennium Development Goals sunset at the end of 2015. The MDGs halved extreme poverty, achieved equal primary education for girls and boys, and dropped HIV infection by 40% among many successes. The SDGs go beyond the MDGs by improving the lives of everyone everywhere and create a better world for future generations. Today, we are 193 young people representing billions more. The youngest Nobel Peace Laureate, Malala, calls on world leaders to keep their promise to every child. Each Lenten we hold represents the hope we have for our future because of the commitments you have made to the global goals. And Pope Francis advised world leaders to put humanity and the environment over politics. Los gobernantes han de hacer todo lo posible a fin de que todos puedan tener la mínima base material y espiritual para ejercer su dignidad y para formar y mantener una familia. 193 nations unanimously committed to the Sustainable Development Goals. It is so decided. But the journey starts here. Now's the time to take global action for local results and move our people and planet towards a sustainable future. Thank you very much. We're going to leave the uh, floor to Ricardo Arzuaga. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, with that context in mind, it is indeed a pleasure to have so many distinguished guests with us tonight in this activity pertaining the SDGs in academia. My name is Ricardo Arzuaga. I'm the executive director of the Puerto Rico chapter of the United Nations Association of the United States. And it's indeed an honor now to pass the microphone to our host and moderator, uh, Mr. Luis Alberto Ferrer Rangel, Chief Social Innovation Officer at GFR. Thank you, Ricardo. Again, a pleasure to be here I'm moderating this very important dialogue and also very honored to be here to have as guests, not only Dr. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, but also the women and men that in Puerto Rico are responsible to keep a higher education going during the earthquakes, during the pandemic, and during the hurricane. Very pleased to be here. And I'm going to pass the baton to Jorge Gonzalez. 
Well, good, e- good evening. Let me. <laughs> good evening. Uh, I'm the president of the board, and one of the things I've learned in life is to not say very much when uh, there's so many people that can say things much better than me. So my role is just to thank you very much, uh, as Ricardo was saying, for joining us, uh, and and we we know you will all learn, and uh, based on this, we will all work together uh, to attain our goals. Thank you. Have a good evening. We'll be with you. Thank you, Jorge. Um, he's the board of, president of the Board of Directors of the UNA USA Foundation. And uh, lastly, I'm going to uh, welcome the Secretary of State, Larry Salehammer, who's going to give us uh, a welcoming remarks from the government uh, perspective. He's a strong advocate of um, sustainability and resilience. And we're very uh, happy to have him uh, on board uh, uh, with all the challenges that that implies. So please, um, Secretary of State. And I believe he's, he's there, but we cannot hear you, Secretary of State, or see you. Maybe the our friends from the control room can help us. Here we go. Am I we can... am I am I on this mic right now? You are on mic, sir. We cannot see you yet, but we can hear you. Okay. How about now? Now we can see you and hear you. Here we go. Welcome. Thank you. Well, my, my greetings to all the participants in this conservatory, in which the main subject is sustainable development goals for 2030 as established by the United Nations Organization. I appreciate the invitation made by our moderator and organizer of this event, Mr. Luis Alberto Ferrer, in a collaborative effort between the Social Innovation Division of GFR and the chapter of Puerto Rico with the United Nations Association of the USA. As well, my recognition and appreciation to Professor Jeffrey Sachs Executive Director for the Center of Sustainable Development Program at Columbia University. As you know, the United Nations created a set of 17 distinct but correlated goals to guide global development targeted at year 2030. Although each of the 17 goals might have a different or unique strategy, I firmly believe that various, not to say many, have a common denominator. That is global warming and climate change. As of 1988, through the initiative of the United Nations, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was created, composed by over 100 countries all over the world and with the designation and participation of their best scientists. By 2013, 25 years from the initial date of the IPCC, a determination and resolution was issued indicating that global warming dominant cause was produced by human influence. The scientific data obtained from numerous studies establishes astonishing results. For example, number one, Earth temperature has rise 1.27 degrees Fahrenheit or 0.85 degrees Celsius in the past 40 years. It took 5,000 years before to account for this temperature raise. Second astonishing results is that carbon dioxide emissions, one of the main producers of greenhouse gas effects and global warming, is at this particular moment 400 parts per million. Last time it surpassed 400 parts per million, it was million years ago. Therefore, it is not a perception or interpret, interpretation on global warming. It is a scientific issue. By 2030, if huge changes are not implemented, damages on our environment 
are going to be monumental, affecting our quality of life. The main goal across the world is to promote measures that can maintain below a rise of two degrees centigrade by 2050, our earth temperature in comparison with the industrial area era. So if we do not attend this effectively, some, maybe many, probably most of the SDG will not be achieved, such as good health, clean water, clean energy, economic growth, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Also sustainable cities, life below water, and life on land. Now I would like to share something that we're doing here in Puerto Rico. We have taken strong and aggressive steps towards implementation of public policy that will result in reducing the effects on global warming. Under Act 17 of 2019, the Puerto Rico energy public policy was created. Among many objectives, I would like to pinpoint the renewable energy portfolio, which seeks a 40% renewable energy portfolio for 2025, 60% for 2040, and 100% for 2050. Also, under Act 33, we established the public policy regarding climate change and plans for mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. Although Puerto Rico is a small contributor in comparison to the rest of the world, we must be proactive and lead other countries. As a matter of fact, the organization German Watch in 2018 appointed Puerto Rico as the first and most vulnerable jurisdiction by consequences of global warming or climate change. In different scientific reports and studies, the adverse consequences of climate change lead to sea level rise, increase on earth temperature, drastic changes in precipitation, acidification at seawater, effects on health, on the economy, on the infrastructure, in atmospheric events, and in our ecosystems each of them affecting our life quality. And I understand, and I take this opportunity to go directly to our education system, our universities and colleges, which are fundamental to establish the foundation to begin our efforts. The synthesis report of 2012 by the IPCC, describes perfectly the urgent action that worldwide must be taken. It states, and I quote, cut carbon pollution sharply starting now or risk severe and irreversible impacts for people on our ecosystems. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary of State. Uh, um, this is a great opportunity for you and the current administration to integrate uh, all the resiliency measures and sustainability measures and the public policy, uh, taking also into account the new um, Biden and Harris administration in the U United States. So thank you so much for being here and thank you, giving your time. Thank you, Mr. Albi It's a pleasure. Thank you. Now we cede uh, the floor to our Guest of honor, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. Um, as you know, he's the director of the SDSN and whomever hasn't heard much of it will learn a lot today about it. Um, he's been also uh, advocate and special, special advisor to Antonio Guterres and the past secretary general also of the United Nations Ban Ki-moon. He's the leading expert on SDGs and sustainability. 
And again, we're thrilled to have you in Puerto Rico. I don't know whether you've ever been in Puerto Rico or no. I, I, of course I have. I'm Welcome. looking forward to the next time. <laughs> The floor Thank is yours, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, it's a great honor to be together with you and, uh, and very exciting uh, because uh, I think the sustainable development goals can, can really help, uh, can help Puerto Rico, can help uh, the Caribbean region, can help the United States, which God knows needs help, uh, and, and the whole world. The idea of the sustainable development goals uh, and it was so nice to see that video. Uh, I remember that day very well when, they, when the goals were adopted, is, is to build a, a better world, a fairer world, and an environmentally uh, survivable and sustainable world. So the basic idea of the sustainable development goals is that we ought to combine economic well-being with social justice and with environmental sustainability. Wouldn't it be nice? Uh, that's uh, the idea. And uh, I very much like the fact that the report that uh, motivated the Sustainable Development Goals was by a committee uh, that titled its report, The Future We Want. Uh, the idea is actually to uh, uh, make ourselves agents of building the future that we really want, uh, rather than suffering the facts as they keep spilling out uh, one by one. Well, I think we're in a more optimistic moment right now than we were in the recent past. Uh, I won't put anyone else uh, on, on the line, but I'll, I'll say we had a, a crazy president and a crazy administration and the United States was uh, at uh, great risk by having Trump, a really nasty man uh, and a dangerous man. And uh, at least we're, we're past that for the moment. But, you know, the United States is a tricky country, as we all know, uh, and we're not done with the demons. Uh, we're not done with the hatred and the racism and so on, which uh, motivates a lot of Americans and has throughout its history. So we still have a struggle ahead, but we, we really have a decent president right now. He's a nice man. He's a well-directed man. I've known him for 30 years. Uh, he wants to do the right thing. And I'm very excited about that. And we're also meeting uh, on a good day when Congress has passed a, a good piece of legislation uh, that's going to give help to people that need it, to people who are unemployed, people who are displaced to state and city governments. If you could believe Trump hated the cities and he just didn't want to help American cities. Uh, but now we have some uh, legislation and some funding also to fight the pandemic. That was another insanity of 2020. If you can imagine, I don't know what it's like in Puerto Rico. I don't know the details, but we have lost 525,000 Americans from COVID. Uh, unbelievable showing what terrible governance means. It means mass suffering and mass loss of life. Well, the Sustainable Development Goals are, are the opportunity to do something better. Incidentally, I don't know if President Trump ever said the words sustainable development goals during his whole administration. I don't even know if he said the words separately. Uh, I never heard him say sustainable for four years. Uh, I don't think he ever said the three words in a row. Uh, I have spent uh, just about every waking hour on the SDG since they were adopted working uh, with the UN and for the UN uh, to try to help uh, pursue the goals. And we had no support whatsoever, but we do need to help inform the Biden administration about the goals because uh, they need reminding uh, and they need reminding that this is for all parts of our country uh, and all of the diverse realities uh, that, uh, that the United States faces. And I think uh, the realities for Puerto Rico are very distinct. Uh, and I would like to do anything to help you 
uh, through our network and through the work uh, that uh, I can do, it, it happens uh, a little bit by coincidence that I was actually asked by the uh, governments in and the UN country teams in the Pacific Island states to work uh, on uh, the vulnerability of the small island developing states uh, just recently. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be working with uh, the SIDS group uh, in the UN to produce a multi-dimensional vulnerability index. Uh, and uh, We've just been discussing that in the last few days, but most of the countries on that list are your neighbors. And a lot of the problem is the problem of the Caribbean region, which uh, as the Secretary of State has just reminded is incredibly vulnerable to the climate change taking place and many other related problems. And Secretary of State, I wouldn't say that it was uh, not mainly your responsibility. Puerto Rico created none of this problem. It's pure victim of this problem. Uh, this is, you know, mainland industry, uh, which has been the main contributor. Uh, Puerto Rico, last time I checked, is not a main oil, gas, or coal producer. Uh, so I don't think you had anything to do with this but you are absolutely in the front line of the damage. And uh, Hurricane Maria and uh, Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Dorian, and you know, the Caribbean is getting smashed by this. And where is the help? Where's the recognition? Uh, where are the investments for resilience uh, and for adaptation, which are essential? Uh, these storms are gonna come with, in, I'm sad, sad to say it, but they are gonna come with increasing intensity and increasing frequency. The sea level is rising. The pressures that are gonna come from this are absolutely real. And it is not free uh, to do this adaptation. And uh, Puerto Rico needs help. The Caribbean needs help. Uh, we need to have, uh, really a much more sensible regional policy because uh, it's the shocks are getting worse, though with ingenuity, the safety can still improve. Uh, people's lives can be saved. Structures can be uh, made more secure. Uh, readiness can be increased. Uh, protection uh, can be made against flooding and other kinds of damage. And it happens that uh, uh, luckily uh, I'm honored and though, and, and uh, it started way in the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> but uh, it's, it involves all of the SIDS, uh, this study. So the first thing I'd like to say to all my academic colleagues, I hope we can work together on this uh, because I think that the chance to view the, the Caribbean from the SDG perspective is really a valuable and interesting uh, opportunity. And of course, I also uh, work with University of West Indies and uh, with a lot of colleagues uh, at UWI. Uh, and I think that there are some real opportunities for collaboration uh, on this. But the point is we also now have a, a government that can hear these things, that can listen, uh, that can respond to something sensible Honestly, it was impossible for the last four years, uh, just sheer nastiness. Uh, and if uh, anyone pointed out vulnerabilities, he would put the pain in even higher, I'm afraid. But now we have a chance and we should use this opportunity to say that uh, Puerto Rico has uh, the following challenges on the sustainable development goals. Uh, and there are several, it's not only climate change, uh, it is on many of the goals and uh, with a clear accounting of what the SDGs show, uh, where the gaps are, where progress should be made and can be made. I think we can get a good hearing on this right now and uh, actually make some very practical proposals for Puerto Rico. But I would say 
more generally, uh, we, we need uh, help throughout the Caribbean region uh, because it, it is a regional crisis and some regional opportunities also uh, and a regional economy uh, that has a lot of shared interest in, uh, uh, in, in uh, protecting tourism, protecting safety, uh, and uh, building uh, an infrastructure that is suitable for the realities of, uh, of the 21st century. The SDSN, uh, let me describe to you briefly, uh, when the first idea of having sustainable development goals was raised back in 2012 uh, at the, uh, what was then the 20th anniversary of the Rio Earth Summit, and it was back in Rio that the group met. Uh, and actually, the uh, Colombian government was the one that recommended having sustainable development goals. I immediately said, that is a great idea, because I was working on the MDGs, and the SDGs would just change one letter. So I thought that was very uh, clever and convenient that we could go from MDGs to SDGs uh, seamlessly. And uh, as soon as that happened, uh, I spoke with the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon about the need to mobilize universities uh, as part of the response to get our scientific knowledge, our engineering schools, uh, our public policy schools, law schools, public health institutions, and so on, working on these goals. And so uh, Secretary General, uh, uh, created this uh, network, uh, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. We have uh, now about 1,400 universities around the world working together on the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, we need very strong uh, role of, uh, of Puerto Rican universities in this. Uh, and uh, you have my full support to do that. So uh, I would Lo love to have that engagement. What the universities are doing is upgrading their teaching programs so that they're teaching sustainable development, which is a really interesting thing to teach because it's uh, not any one discipline, it's problem solving uh, about uh, energy systems, about climate, about uh, public health, uh, about fighting poverty, creating good jobs, social protection. So it's really a cross-disciplinary education, which I find very, very interesting. I, maybe I don't know much about anything anymore, but I know a little bit about a lot. So <laughs> that I think is a, an interesting approach anyway. Uh, and the universities are working very much with governments in different parts of the world to help formulate detailed plans, for example, for the energy transformation. And I've been on calls much of the day uh, about the European Green Deal and European universities working with Brussels on their transformation, uh, Chinese universities working with the Chinese government on China's energy transformation, Pakistani universities I was with uh, working on uh, Pakistan's uh, SDG transformation. But this is a, a second uh, major part is the, uh, is, is the research agenda and the work with governments to really formulate strong policies. And a third part is the work of universities to support the business sector because uh, all businesses really need to transform also. We're gonna have different energy systems. We're gonna have electric vehicles. We're gonna have uh, 5G uh, digital services uh, and businesses uh, are going to be a huge part of that transformation. And universities can train the future workforce, uh, but also they can work with industry on technological changes uh, that are aligned with uh, sustainability. So this is another area. And I find it uh, very rewarding and very promising and believe uh, if I might say that I, I think that partnerships of universities, business and government are really important right now because nobody knows how to do what we need to do. 
Uh, this is something different. Uh, and it's not normal politics. Uh, it's not what our departments in government necessarily know by themselves. Academics, by the way, know a lot, but they're often very impractical. So it's very good to get the uh, academic side engaged in the real problem solving uh, where the Secretary of State can explain, look, this is the real problem we face right now and help us solve the real problem, not the journal article problem, but the real academic, uh, the, the real life problem that we face. And of course, business really needs skilled labor uh, uh, and uh, skilled workers uh, to be able to uh, be on top of these changes. Time is pretty urgent. Uh, I think, uh, I don't think I would have to convince anyone in Puerto Rico about that. We're very late in the day uh, to adjust to these changes. It is incredible how long one can waste time, by the way. Uh, it's stunning. Uh, we just wasted four years in the United States uh, with a, a nut case administration and uh, going completely in the wrong direction and making enemies uh, everywhere in the world. And now we're trying to catch up for uh, lost time and lost ground. But remember 2020 set a record for the warmest year on record, actually tied with 2016. But 2016 was a, an El Nino year and 2020 was a La Nina year, which is supposed to be cooler, but they came out the same. And that's frightening because if you adjust for the state of the ocean, definitely 2020 was the hottest year in history. And I have a colleague, by the way, uh, one of the world's greatest, he's probably the world's greatest climate scientist, James Hansen, who's a very famous uh, climate scientist, who uh, I hate to tell you, but he scares the wits out of me. He's a very soft-spoken, lovely man from Iowa, uh, just a Midwesterner uh, in the U.S., as decent uh, and soft-spoken as can be. But he always tells me the situation's even worse than we know. Uh, you know, the changes taking place in uh, the Earth's systems, in the Southern Ocean, in the uh, ocean circulation, which we know now is really slowing uh, dangerously uh, in the uh, increased intensity of storms and so forth is happening faster uh, at an accelerated rate. So all of this is to say we have our work cut out for us. Uh, I love the question, have I been in Puerto Rico? Uh, uh, and, and the answer is, of course I have several times, but not recently enough. So let's work together. <laughs> and uh, uh, it would be fantastic to work on these challenges together. Uh, they're big, but they're really uh, crucial. And final point that I'll say, young people want to work on these issues. Students want to work on these issues. They want to be empowered to learn, to understand, to help change things. And that is extremely gratifying for us in academia. Our students are pulling us as fast as possible into uh, this kind of problem solving. So I think we have uh, all uh, gears and signals pointing in the direction for moving ahead now. And please count on me. And thank you for letting me join you today. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Professor Sachs. I think uh, the message is uh, loud and clear. And um, we have members of the uh, private sector here. We have members of universities. Obviously, this is an academic setting right now. And we have members of the public sector. And the challenge really is how do we um, work together and act together, uh, align you know, uh, along these, um, these goals. Um, now we are going to take advantage, sir, of your uh, minutes here. I believe you have until about, uh, you have like 20 minutes or so, yeah. 25, 25 minutes or so, um, to have somewhat of a structured uh, session here because we want to have opportunities for each university to ask you a question, Wonderful. make you a comment, and, and you can um, you know, respond back. And we're going to go in our theoretical order. When you get, we're going to get started with Universidad Albizu, uh, Dr. Jose Pons Madera, please. 
Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, good evening, Dr. Sachs. Thank you for sharing with us your, your insights and your perspective. Uh, my question is very simple. Could you talk to us a little bit about the last part of what you said about the reaction of students in terms of academia? Uh, what approaches are being used? Are these uh, in the universities where it's being implemented? Is this like curricular infusion? Because this goes throughout the whole thing. I mean, we're talking about a biological aspects, social aspects, ethics, moral. I mean, I, I could see Actually, what came to my mind in reading the, the, the document is the, uh, uh, the characteristic of, a, of the educated person, which is something that university presidents struggles all the time because when we come up with a list, it, it gets outdated and we have to move to, uh, to how to update that. And I may say that I see a huge link between what is an educated person and, and what would be someone who is educated in understanding the sustainable goal, uh, uh, development goals? I mean, I, that's my reaction to you. I see one thing, and please let me know how, how this is implemented. Fantastic. Uh, I think that there are uh, several uh, issues, and I see it the same way as you do. Uh, and maybe I'll put it uh, in terms of my own experience. Uh, I led a project at Columbia University for 14 years called the Earth Institute, which was uh, an initiative uh, by the university to uh, try to grapple with problems like climate change uh, and other environmental threats. And though I'm an economist, they brought me into this scientist's uh, unit, uh, and uh, I had a chance to emphasize the concepts of sustainable development uh, in this context. So uh, what I learned from this is that first, if you get the students and the faculty around problem solving, uh, it could be the problems of the energy transition. It could be the problems of uh, climate change in the Caribbean, uh, or the ecological changes that are underway in the Caribbean, or it could be social challenges, but uh, array the students and the faculty around the problems uh, and say all the different disciplines have a role to play in this. Uh, so uh, you need the climatologists to explain the basic dynamics. You need the engineers because the climatologists are not engineers. They can identify the problem, but they can't solve it. Uh, the engineers can generally solve the problem, but they can't turn it into public policy. Uh, you need some economists uh, and political scientists to say, ah, okay, now I understand what we need to do, but here's how you can do it, fitting into the budgetary process, the political process, uh, and so forth. Uh, you need the psychologists to, social psychologists to explain here is why Donald Trump doesn't get it or whatever the, the, the question is, or here is how to get an educated public around this. And I really like what you said. I'm spending a lot of time with ethics right now. Uh, and uh, I spend a lot of time at the Vatican actually uh, in the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences because the Pope has issued phenomenal encyclicals uh, that are so interesting, Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti, his two great encyclicals. One is about how to address climate change from an ethical point of view. And Fratelli Tutti, his new encyclical is about how to work together across ethnic, racial, geographical lines. Uh, and it's a wonderful document, by the way, uh, really something very special. But if you don't teach ethics, it's also hard to get this uh, engagement. And I can tell you, I, I had a PhD, I have a PhD in economics. Uh, I did not have one day of formal ethics education uh, in undergraduate or graduate. Mm. Uh, of course, I, I had something, but it was not 
proper education. So some decades later, I'm spending a lot of time with philosophers <laughs> and a lot of time with uh, moral philosophy. And I kind of wish someone had banged it into me 40 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sachs. Um, I think the challenges we're facing also in universities is integrating knowledge, you know, and how to break the silos of the scientific thinking divorce from the religious thinking article. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's go to American University. Licenciado Juan Nazario, please, uh, Squire. Yes, good evening, Dr. Sachs. Uh, thanks for the time you're spending with us and all your knowledge. Uh, I would say that you uh, almost uh, answered the question that I had, but let me tell you, here in the institution we started working last year uh, regarding the sustainable development goals. And uh, we've done many, several things, uh, but, uh, but as you may know, many things has been postponed for the next fall because of the challenges that we've been facing. But I can let you know that uh, the young people, our students, they're very eager to start working, working with this. Uh, we have had some opportunities to meet with them to exchange our views in this matter. And uh, they're very aware, they're very aware of what's going on because what they have faced uh, here in Puerto Rico because of the natural disasters and uh, what we're facing with the COVID-19. Uh, uh, and also uh, they're very aware of what was happening in the mainland because of CNN, right? Yeah, so yeah, you yeah, mentioned yeah. the last four years and it was a learning experience for everyone. So uh, we're very excited because we know that they uh, know, they understand that there are big challenges ahead, yep. but also great opportunities. And uh, as professionals, as entrepreneurs, but also as citizens of the world and uh, very young, we, most of us, I hope that we all have many years to spend together and talk about this, but their, their perspective is as a uh, young generation. And they're very worried, they're very concerned, but they are committed and so are we. So I would like to have the opportunity to meet with you and, and work in this area uh, uh, in the near future. Again, thank you and uh, you, you have all our support. No, it's a, one, you have my support and I think it would be great uh, if we could uh, get together uh, get students uh, from all of the universities uh, to get together on a Zoom. Uh, and we could have a good discussion about uh, the future of Puerto Rico, the future of the United States, mm -hmm. the future of the Caribbean region, uh, mm -hmm. talk about uh, regional policy uh, and areas of interest. I love that, uh, by the way, uh, it, it, it would be wonderful to do. Um, and I think we could listen uh, well to the perspectives of, uh, of the students uh, and things that they feel they really need for empowerment. Yes. But what I find is, you know, having the students uh, take on uh, a challenge or look to the development challenge of Puerto Rico or look to the question of the Caribbean and in an era of uh, global warming and uh, worsening hurricanes and what do we do? Uh, and what are some of the uh, best approaches and what scientific research can be done and so on, we would find a lot of energy, a lot of really bright, uh, obviously very bright students, but a lot of very bright ideas. And then one of the things that this network can do is connect the students with faculty from any part of the world. Uh, what's happening in another place? What's happening in East Asia? with the typhoons, what are good ideas, uh, you know, that we can uh, exchange across uh, geographies. And it would be fantastic to do that. It is one of the, uh, the, the uh, lessons of COVID is that we've learned how to Zoom well. So uh, we could do that with the students uh, sometime soon. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Sachs. Um, let's go to Universidad Central del Caribe, Dr. Valesca Crespo. Hi, good evening to everyone. And thank you, Dr. Sachs, for sharing with us these important areas of knowledge. And I think that your call to action is a responsibility for all of us as educators. And in our case, 
we prepare healthcare professionals, especially um, MDs. And for my students has been very interesting the, the starting the conversation about health disparities and how the health disparities are directly related with the economical status of the population, but also the political status of Puerto Rico. Yep. I think that we have uh, the perfect uh, scenario right now to continue that type of discussions in Puerto Rico, trying to get some solutions, some answers, not only keeping the, the conversations, but I think that it's time to establish the goals to fix some of our situations and establish what outcomes we want to get a society. And that is that needs to be an essential part of our curriculums and in all um, levels of education from, I think from K to 12 and then in higher ed at different levels because it matters to all of us as society. Fantastic. And, and I will be more than thrilled to collaborate with you. I continue collaborations with my other colleagues in Puerto Rico. I, I would love to do this. Uh, also, uh, I'm uh, uh, good friends and colleague with the new head of the Centers for Disease Control uh, in Atlanta. And we ought to get CDC engaged at looking at some of the specific challenges of Puerto Rico health, uh, health systems, health disparities as well. So that would be uh, another thing to do. Interestingly, by the way, uh, in the SDSN network, uh, President uh, Wayne Fredrickson of Howard University uh, is uh, um, a wonderful uh, university leader, uh, very much interested in health disparities. Uh, it's one of his areas of expertise. He's also a surgeon, actually. So he's a medical doctor. But I'm engaged with him, and SDSN is engaged with Howard University on the health disparities issue. So if we follow up, I'm sure that we could make a really fruitful connection for areas of study, which I would absolutely love to do. Uh, and so count on me for that. And I am uh, sachs at columbia.edu. So very easy, S-A-C-H-S -S at columbia.edu. And uh, please, anyone feel free to write and, and uh, to, to reach out to me and we'll follow up uh, for sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doctora. Uh, also to remind that um, Marcela Nunez-Smith, she's from St. Thomas and she is the uh, co-chair for Biden's um, uh, COVID response. Marcela, I'm sure she's a Yale professor. I'm sure Jeffrey Sachs know her. Yeah, her. great. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And she's from St. Thomas. So uh, I didn't. Yeah, just, I didn't remember that. So very yeah. good. All right. USVI. USVI. Yeah. All right. Going on. I know we're running out of time. Um, Dr. Isaac Esquilin from uh, Huertas College. I don't know that he's here. Forgive me if I. Yes. Uh, just moving on then. Um, Licenciado Manuel Fernos from University of Inter-American Inter University. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Alvi, and uh, uh, greetings to Professor Sachs and to my fellow uh, presidents, uh, university presidents. As I listened to you, Dr. Sachs, I was taking some notes, and and I thought that maybe we have to uh, address uh, the sustainable development goals topic in, in two different perspectives. One would be sustainable development goals for the universities themselves, within the universities, uh, because uh, we have difficult times, so we have to be uh, cost effective, uh, especially because we address middle class students. Uh, so we have to try to ha keep our tuition costs as, as low as possible so that the Pell Grant would cover all tuition expenses. So that's, that's a challenge. Uh, then we have to keep, keep preserve quality uh, of academic programs. And, 
And so when you have to combine two, the, those two different challenges, the only way to do it is with great imagination, uh, <laughs> being very effective, uh, right sizing the university. But when I speak of, of quality education, I'm not talking only about quality of knowledge, the knowledge being taught. Oh, this is my cost effective. <laughs> yeah, very good. <laughs> very good. Energy efficiency. But, not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> but we also teach uh, ethics. Ethics is a course required for all different curriculums in Inter-American University. So, and then you have the, the issue within the university of resiliency. As you mentioned, we have had hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, pandemic now, and we have to respond to all of those. Uh, and government, I must say, federal government was quite slow with this. So we have to work with our insurances, to repair, prevent damages on the before the hurricanes, and then we have to repair after the hurricane and do it fast so that we could go back as fast as possible to for an opening reopening the, the university for the students. Then the pandemic, we well, we even though in the case of Inter American, we had prior to the pandemic six, 67 online asynchronic courses. So we wow. had quite an experience on this. Wow. But we have over 200 on-site courses, uh, academic programs. We have to, within two weeks to move them to synchronic online teaching. Now we have learned a lot in a short time. And I and universities will not be the same after the uh, COVID-19. The, the, the way we teach has changed. Students Many of them now prefer online teaching. So we are <laughs> changing times. Then the second area, the second perspective, I would say is the role of the universities in helping Puerto Rico develop goals, sustainable development goals. That's a responsibility we have. And then I, I might say that uh, we have to, in, in the case of Inter-American, but I know all, all the uh, universities in Puerto Rico have done, this, have done the same. We have include in our, we have a strategic plan, a four-year plan. We, every year we renew the, the plan, we update the plan. Now we have included there the concept, not which academic programs have high, are high demand in the market, no. The question we are answering is what knowledge, what expertise, uh, what capacity uh, our graduates need to have so that they will develop a new Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. The new Thank Puerto you. Rico Thank we, you, we want. And, Thank and you. that's fantastic. That's considering, of course, the development of Puerto Rico and sustainable development of Puerto Rico. Now, one issue we have here, we have here, is, is that that's the way, that's our vision of Puerto Rico. Now, my question is, do we have a common vision for Puerto Rico? The private sector, the government sector, do we share a common vision for Puerto Rico? I, the answer is no. But the SDGs can provide that answer. I think uh, we have to work on that. We have to work yeah, on that. Let's go to well, the answers. Thank you, Lisa. So, are, are gone, so. <laughs> yeah, let, let me thank you very much. Sorry. Let me give you just a quick reaction. First of all, uh, I think, uh, yes, we will have new kinds of education and new kinds of universities. Uh, we just did a survey among my staff in SDSN. When do you want to come back to the office? And the answer was never. <laughs> you know, people are getting really getting used to working at a distance. They will come in a day a week, maybe, but we're really going to change how we work uh, and how we teach. The online can be very effective, actually, for a lot of the teaching. Obviously, you know, and you're doing it. It can also save a lot of money, actually, both for the students and so on. But we, we have to figure all of this out. And I think it's, a, it's an extremely uh, interesting time for us. Uh, as universities to do that. 
let, let me mention one other basic point, which is obvious, uh, but I think important. The universities in Puerto Rico can pl- need to play a, a unique role within the U.S. academia in understanding the Caribbean, obviously. Uh, no one but uh, people living in the, in the Caribbean can understand the Caribbean challenges, the realities, the history, the ecology, uh, the uh, climate risks, and all the rest. And so there's a special role of universities in general in understanding the local context uh, and the uh, regional context. And you know how ignorant of geography mainland America is. Unbelievable, actually, unbelievable. Uh, But uh, it means that we really need your leadership, both for, of course, Puerto Rico's own future, this goes without saying, but also for the regional understanding, uh, for the regional ecology, uh, what to do about uh, hurricane risk, what to do uh, on all the other topics that we're talking about. No one but you can figure this out. This is for sure. It can never come from Washington. It can never come from outside. No one cares enough to figure it out, frankly. Uh, and so in this sense, uh, you know, the intellectual leadership that uh, the universities can provide is uniquely important for this challenge. And I think it's just very exciting uh, to, you know, to have that leadership And it's like we've all been saying, it's what the students also want and what they need for their empowerment. So thank thank you very much. Great observations. Thank you, Professor Sachs. We have three more institutions, sir. Do you have, can you spare a few more minutes? Yeah, I have a a hard, uh, sorry that I talk so long. I have a hard stop at uh, 6.12, (laughs) so uh, my time, so in uh, eight minutes. Okay, okay, all right. Um, we'll make sure that we get as many people as we can in. Um, from the Catholic University of uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Señor Jorge Vélez, Mr. Jorge Vélez Arrocho. Jorge Vélez Arrocho? Uh, yes. Yes. Mute. Mute. yes. Yeah, go ahead. In your recent book, The Ages of Globalization, geography, technology, and institutions, you emphasize the need for new methods of international governance and cooperation to prevent conflicts and to achieve economic, social, and environmental objectives aligned with sustainable development. At the local level in Puerto Rico, I think that we have a similar challenge which is to achieve higher objectives of sustainable development. And the challenge is how to establish new methods of institutional and regional uh, governance and cooperation to prevent conflicts. How we do that with our universities? We have the universities. But, but each, even though we have some instances of cooperation, I think that to reach the sustainable development goals in Puerto Rico, we have to create, as you mentioned in your book, new methods to govern our efforts in terms of sustainable development. And I think that's a challenge for our island, and I think it is a challenge for our universities count on me to help uh, if I can. I found it, I realized after 40 years of being an economist, we have a strange idea which we call perfect competition. That's the ideal of a market economy. But why don't we have a concept of perfect cooperation instead of perfect competition? (laughs) Uh, And uh, we don't even have that concept. Uh, So we need improved cooperation. That's what Pope Francis is emphasizing in Fratelli Tutti, by the way. Yes, yes, and, and, and we really need this also in the Caribbean region. There's so much insecurity uh, and uh, so much divisiveness, but one region, 
And uh, I think th this uh, is also an opportunity at the regional level uh, that is extremely important. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sachs. Um, we're going now to University of Puerto Rico, Dr. Jorge Haddock. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sachs, for, the, uh, for this uh, interesting opportunity. And, and uh, thank you for sharing all the knowledge and experience you have. Uh, I think that you, you really obviously presented most of the most important aspects of, of these uh, seven initiatives, 17 initiatives. So I like to frame this in a very um, ambitious question so I can cover as many as possible. Because I was leaning towards the, uh, I was leaning towards the partnerships because here you have some of the most important academic leaders on the island and, and certainly some of the most uh, impactful government and, and industry leaders. So I really wanted, I was moving, leaning towards what are the, the, the best practices that you found in creating these partnerships. But in my ambitious question, I like to go back in the late 70s and 80s when I was working in my PhD dissertation, it was on energy planning. And frankly, 40 years later, uh, you, you see that the, the, the cost alternatives haven't changed much. I mean, we've made progress on energy, uh, solar energy and wind, but not really that much for 40 years, it's four decades. So I think that if we project this to the future, what, what I'm thinking is that it, it can be a cost effective solution. And you mentioned ethics, you, mer you, you mentioned the moral dilemma. So how can we really address it? And, and I mean, I'm talking about energy as an example, yeah. but it applies to virtually all of them. I mean, I'm an engineer, but well, I've also been a business school dean. And you can talk about the, co the, the cost effectiveness or the cost impact on virtually any of the 17. I mean, how can working towards the 17, most of those 17 is also going to be uh, beneficial financially and, and, and economically for any country in the world. But it can be cost. It has to be more, I mean, it has to, it has to be a moral dilemma question that we pose ourselves. So in my ambitious question would be, how can we partner up to really make both arguments in a way that we can really move the needle and say, how can we, for the people that think it has to be a cost, a cost solution, cost effective solution, we use some of those arguments, but for, for really the, the strongest arguments have to be, this is a moral dilemma that we're facing and that we are, have to leave a legacy for future generations. Wonder, wonderful. I, I think uh, uh, there are two quick points that I would raise to a complicated big issue. One is I would recommend for Puerto Rico and I would be happy to help on this, that there should be a, maybe a one or two day conference on sustainable development for Puerto Rico's future that is multi-sector uh, and that goes through a number of the key challenges, uh, whether it is uh, education, jobs, health, uh, energy system, uh, resiliency and so on. And that it is government, academia uh, and uh, business and civil society in a kind of national forum. Uh, and this could be, you know, planned for three to six months from now, uh, but a real opportunity to put the goals there and then to have a, a national discussion around them that is all the stakeholders uh, and uh, academia can be the host of uh, this kind of thing and help to organize it. I have found that to be very effective. It uh, generates lots of discussion uh, it generates lots of disagreement, but one finds out where the shared vision is uh, and, uh, and, and where the differences are. A second point that I would say is uh, energy planning, for example, is crucially important right now. Uh, here, we're going to have President Biden say we're going to decarbonize by 2050. Uh, even uh, the mm -hmm power generation is supposed to be decarbonized by 2035 uh, compared to uh, um, uh, on the uh, campaign basis. And he's going to unveil draft legislation soon. This is a planning problem. Uh, what are the alternative costs? What kind of solutions? Is this something that Puerto Rico does on its own? Is it something that is Caribbean wide? Is it, uh, can you think of a regional grid in across the islands? Does that make sense? Offshore wind, what, what, are, what are the real opportunities here? 
uh, what can be done in photovoltaics, what can be done in mini hydro, what can be done in, uh, in uh, wind onshore, offshore, and so on. Great problem for students to work on, by the way. I'm doing a lot of scenario analysis that really is energy planning scenarios. Uh, we have a project called Deep Decarbonization Pathways. We did a US analysis, a broad US analysis uh, called the Zero Carbon Action Plan out of the SDSN uh, that we delivered to the Biden administration. But thinking about doing such a plan for the Caribbean and for Puerto Rico uh, and asking, so what are the right options given costs, given techno technology options? If we're really gonna decarbonize, how could this be done? I think is a very valid point. And then, as I was emphasizing earlier, Puerto Rico and the neighbors have a lot of adaptation costs ahead. And that really needs to be paid for from outside because it's expensive. But these risks are not Puerto Rico's fault. <laughs> they are the fault of global climate change of which uh, Puerto Rico is suffering consequences right now. And uh, I know just for New York City, the project is a minimum of $20 billion uh, to control flooding in New York City after Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and they're, you know, they've debated now almost 10 years who's going to pick up the bill. Uh, but you can imagine we need to do that kind of scenario building for resiliency and adaptation. And again, I would like to see a Caribbean wide analysis because the whole region is getting hit again and again and again. And we need a solution that is region wide. Thank you, but, Professor but Sachs, on. for your time. Yeah, I, you know, I, unfortunately, I have a call coming in in about 30 seconds. I apologize to those who did not answer because I speak too long. Uh, but I hope uh, if I could just say in closing that we can follow up. Uh, it's really great to be with you. I'm very excited. Uh, you have a tremendous group of universities and university leaders, and it would be a great pleasure for me to help uh, as, as a follow-up. So I would look forward to that. Thank you, will do, will do. You have a good day. Wonderful. Thank you for your time. Th thanks to everybody. Great, thanks a lot. Take care. Bien, muchísimas gracias a, a todas y a todos por participar. Le vamos a dar la oportunidad a la Universidad del Sagrado Corazón para que nos comente eh, lo que eh, quisiera eh, el presidente Marsuach este, compartir y luego pasaremos, pasaremos al, a la presentación y al final de la actividad. Así que adelante, Gilberto. No se oye, Gilberto, por alguna razón. Estás en mute. En mute. Sí. Ahora. Yeah. Gracias, Luis Alberto. Gracias a ti, a, a GFR y a, a UN e USA por organizar esta actividad, ¿verdad? Eh, nada, un comentario breve, eh, Albi, eh, escuchando las la, la palabras del doctor Sachs y, y de mis colegas presidentes universitarios, ¿verdad? O sea, lo, lo, los retos que tenemos en Puerto Rico, ¿verdad? Eh, que requieren eh, investigación, eh, requieren desarrollo de política pública coordinada, requiere desarrollo de, de iniciativas eh, concretas eh, para atender muchos de los retos de los, de los eh, objetivos de desarrollo eh, mundial, ¿verdad? Eh, y, y la pregunta es, eh, ¿cómo las universidades podríamos trabajar en conjunto, ¿verdad? Para, para atender muchos de estos temas, ¿verdad? Yo creo que el, el, el doctor Sachs planteó el tema de, de colaboración eh, sector público, sector privado, sector universitario, me parece que para enfrentar estos temas que son multidisciplinarios y multisectoriales, ¿verdad? Eh, necesitamos tener eh, formas de, de colaboración transsectorial, ¿verdad? Y, y es un reto que, que hemos identificado en Puerto Rico a través de, de mucho tiempo, ¿verdad? Pero, pero creo que, que es, una, es una pregunta urgente. Y, y me parece que las universidades, tanto la Universidad del Estado como las universidades eh, públicas, ¿verdad? Que somos entidades al servicio público. Tal vez podemos tener un rol de, de, de marcar un, una ruta de colaboración entre nosotros para, para eh, abrir el camino para, para atender estos temas. Necesitamos coordinar estrategias de investigación, 
necesitamos coordinar estrategias de, de políticas públicas, necesitamos coordinar estrategias de desarrollo de iniciativas. Eh, y, y, y me parece que en, en aglutinar esfuerzos pueden haber oportunidades de sinergia y de efectividad que si actuamos por separado. Así que es un, es un comentario que comparto, ¿verdad? Que, que me parece que, que complementa bien lo que mis colegas presidentes y presidentas han comentado en, en la noche de hoy. Y, y yo creo que apunta hacia la, el diálogo que vamos a tener ¿no? al cierre de la, de la tarde. Eh, así que muchísimas gracias, Gilberto. Eh, vamos a pasar entonces a la, a la presentación de, de Ricardo Arzuaga y luego retomamos. Muchísimas gracias por sus preguntas. He tomado notas y creo que podemos tener una buena, una excelente cierre. Está en mute, Ricardo. Muchísimas gracias, eh, Luis Alberto. Muchas gracias por, por esta primera parte eh, de la actividad. Eh, ahora voy a estar eh, presentándoles por espacio de 10 minutos un poquito de contexto también para abonar a la discusión de, del restante de la actividad sobre qué colaboraciones ya se han dado. Precisamente eh, el presidente Marsuache estaba hablando de la importancia de las colaboraciones, no solamente entre universidades, sino diferentes sectores. O sea que voy a estar destacando algunas de esas colaboraciones que hemos forjado de 2016 al 2020 y cómo estas colaboraciones han de ayudarnos a propulsarnos en esta década de acción de 2021 a 2030. Eh, comienzo destacándoles que esto comenzó en el 2015 eh, con el 70 aniversario de la Organización de Naciones Unidas y nuestra matriz United Nations Association of the United States, que es un programa de la Fundación de Naciones Unidas, pues nos habló eh, y nos exhortó a establecer un proyecto especial en Puerto Rico para promover estos objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Eh, comenzamos con una actividad donde estuvo Lecna Pérez de la Fundación de Naciones Unidas. Eh, antes, más de 500 estudiantes, eh, maestros, esto fue en la Universidad de Puerto Rico en Calle, o sea, con shout out a, al doctor Haddock, eh, rompimos récord de asistencia ese, ese, eh, ese día, así me comentaron los técnicos, nunca habían tenido un, un teatro de Calle completamente lleno y miren los estudiantes sentados en el piso al frente. Precisamente aquí comenzamos a forjar colaboraciones, eh, colaboraciones con el Departamento de Educación, colaboraciones con el Departamento del Interior, eh, el National Park Service, para ver cómo comenzábamos a dar a conocer estos objetivos de desarrollo sostenible en diferentes sectores. Este fue el comunicado de prensa que se generó sobre este proyecto especial por el aniversario de Naciones Unidas. Y eh, luego de eso, pues todos, todos nos acordamos que, que en el 2017 eh, eh, tuvimos, pues, enfrentamos gran adversidad, pero esta adversidad eh, no, nos, nos motivó, nos propulsó a ponerle aún más empeño a esto y, y estamos muy agradecidos a, a UNA USA eh, que nos ayudó precisamente a continuar este proyecto en Puerto Rico y esto fue a través de una actividad de Giving Tuesday que hicieron eh, para ayudarnos a continuar el proyecto y precisamente hicimos una, una actividad eh, sobre eh, el Acuerdo de París, sobre cambio climático. Eh, esto fue el 9 de diciembre de 2017, o sea que apenas unos meses, menos de tres meses luego de, lo, de los huracanes, eh, lo hicimos con, con generadores de FEMA eh, en CROE, que en el Centro Residencial de Oportunidades Educativas en Ceiba. Y básicamente eh, eh, fue una excelente actividad donde lo, los estudiantes tuvieron la oportunidad no solamente de hablar de del Acuerdo de París sobre Cambio Climático, eh, sino también eh, desahogarse un poco y, y dar su perspectiva sobre cómo Puerto Rico eh, puede ayudar en el tópico de acción climática. Eh, algo interesante que, que pasó, y, y UNA USA fue quien nos conectó, eh, fue precisamente un, un pedido que recibimos del portavoz del Secretario General de Naciones Unidas, él se llama Stefan Dujarek y Stefan nos escribe un correo electrónico donde nos deja saber que, que su hijo de quinto grado en el Collegiate School de Nueva York 
eh, quería eh, donar un dinero a Puerto Rico y hizo una, una, una recaudación de fondos con sus eh, eh, colegas eh, estudiantes de quinto grado y querían que esos 600 dólares que recaudaran fueran directamente a escuelas en Puerto Rico que lo necesitaran para adelantar estos objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Nosotros, nuestra recomendación fue eh, precisamente que este apoyo fuera dirigido a eh, dos escuelas del Departamento de Educación de Puerto Rico, la escuela de Ceiba que les mencioné, pero también la Pedro Rivera Molina de Juncos, los cuales estaban empezando los, primer, los primeros proyectos de Project Based Learning o aprendizaje eh, basado en, en acción eh, sobre los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Y ellos nos solicitaron que, que les gustaría pues, tener banderas de Naciones Unidas, tener banners eh, de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, algo que les ayudara a ellos en eh, promoverlos en sus escuelas. Y aquí les enseño algunas alguna fotos. Estos son los estudiantes de, de CROEC, eh, donde eh, recibieron esto, estos iconos de los ODS y estos banners. Eh, también pues, los estudiantes en la Pedro Rivera Molina, esto es una maestra de, de inglés que solicitó que los materiales se le fueran, eh, se le proveyeran en inglés y ven a los estudiantes aquí con sus diferentes, con sus diferentes eh, eh, iconos de, lo, de los ODS y también firmaron una, una bandera para agradecer a, a Julian Dujaric por esta, por esta aportación que les hiciera. Usando esta historia como inspiración y y pendiente para asistir a otros eh, colegios de K a 12 en Puerto Rico eh, que puedan integrar los ODS, vamos a estar colaborando bien de cerca con el Sustainable Development Solutions Network, precisamente de Profesor Sachs, y un programa que han desarrollado que se llama el Global Schools Program. Hay miles de, de colegios que están precisamente integrando este programa y este es el tipo de acciones concretas que podamos hacer en Puerto Rico para integrar, como sugirieron ustedes mismos en el panel y como sugirió el profesor Sachs, cómo podemos envolver a la educación K a 12 eh, con todo esto hacia la década de acción de 2021 a 2030. Este es el logo del Global Schools Program y verdaderamente tienen una variedad de publicaciones de lecciones para el salón de clase en español eh, por, el, por el doctor Fernando Reimers de Harvard College, eh, que son excelentes para a, aplicarlas en Puerto Rico. También estamos trabajando con diferentes facultades de educación con el fin de desarrollar contenido totalmente pertinente para Puerto Rico y con estadísticas relacionadas con Puerto Rico para que los estudiantes empiecen a, a bregar con estos problemas y a a, a ir plantando esa semilla en la mente de nuevas generaciones de estudiantes sobre la importancia de la sostenibilidad y los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible en general. Otra importante iniciativa para avanzar los objetivos de desarrollo en Puerto Rico era unir precisamente a las partes interesadas. Y eso entiéndase pues gobierno, el sector privado, la academia, la sociedad civil, en un sistema colaborativo eh, que le hemos llamado el grupo de trabajo de los ODS en Puerto Rico. Este es el logo que se ha creado para este grupo. Actualmente está compuesto por más de 70 organizaciones y más de 180 personas, seres humanos, que son los colaboradores o representantes de estas organizaciones en este ecosistema de colaboración. Voy a estar enfocando el resto de mi presentación en los componentes principales o en la función principal de este grupo de trabajo, que es promover integrar, avanzar, medir y financiar estos objetivos de desarrollo sostenible en Puerto Rico. Empezamos y el primer test de este grupo de trabajo fue precisamente la visita en Puerto Rico de una expedición científica apoyado por el gobierno de España, el cual eh, llegó a Puerto Rico en enero 2020. Muchos de ustedes no escucharon esto porque estábamos en el medio de terremotos, como ustedes recordarán y como hicieron hincapié en sus presentaciones. Este fue el comunicado de prensa cuando el verero Acuarela de la expedición Oceania llegó a Puerto Rico. Eh, ahí les tengo que destacar algunos de los colaboradores en este grupo de trabajo, comenzando con Para la Naturaleza, que fue el coanfitrión de esta expedición, pero también al Servicio Forestal, a Puerto Rico al Sur, Custom and Border Protection, 
Local Guest, el Consulado de España en Puerto Rico, San Juan Bay Marina, Bombazo Dance Company. Eso es colaboración y, y las colaboraciones no son fáciles. Es importante que la gente se conozca y esto fue un excelente ejercicio que hicimos en Puerto Rico para recibir estos científicos en Puerto Rico. Estos son algunos de los jóvenes que estaban en la conferencia de prensa en San Juan Bay Marina y luego eh, fuimos directamente, ahí viene la, la bandera de España del catamarán, una foto grupal previo a visitar el proyecto TRACE que es un proyecto eh, sobre el impacto del cambio climático en bosques tropicales. Es el primero, el único eh, de, de, en el mundo que está eh, bregando con esta investigación y es parte del Instituto de Dazonomía Tropical. O sea que ahí los estudiantes tuvieron la oportunidad de ver ese proyecto científico en acción y ver precisamente pues, todos los componentes que envuelve. Esto es parte del proyecto metido en, el, en, el, en nuestro bosque nacional, el Yunque, y por supuesto, eh, eh, tocando tre, dos de los ODS, eh, acción climático y, y, y vida en ecosistemas terrestres. Este fue el, el comunicado que sacó Trace sobre esa visita. Y luego el segundo día fuimos exclusivamente para la naturaleza, nos extendió la cortesía de abrir la, la, la Reserva Natural, las cabezas de San Juan, para esta expedición. Ahí se continuó el, el documental sobre este proyecto con staff de, de Para la Naturaleza, eh, donde les dejaron saber a todos los participantes lo que estaban haciendo y la importancia de estos ecosistemas en Puerto Rico. Eh, Fernando Llovera eh, estuvo con nosotros eh, durante la tarde y fue un excelente día. Este fue el segundo eh, día de la expedición. Luego, al otro día, fuimos a Ponce. Eh, pocos de ustedes, y yo era uno de ellos, eh, desconocen que hay un, un monumento sobre la, la, la abolición de la esclavitud en Ponce, que es el único en el Caribe, y precisamente ustedes se imaginarán eh, eh, que estábamos precisamente en el medio de los terremotos, pero todo este grupo de ponceños que nos recibieron, a la verdad que nos dejaron saber cómo para ellos, fue un, un, un stress relief el estar con nosotros eh, esa tarde filmando allá en Ponce con grupos culturales eh, que estuvieron con nosotros. Y, y los temblores en esta ocasión fueron temblores de cultura que tuvimos allá en Ponce con esta expedición, también dejando saber qué estamos haciendo y la importancia de, de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible también en la cultura y también en ese monumento histórico que pocos en Puerto Rico conocemos. Este fue el comunicado de prensa que se desarrolló sobre esta expedición. Y entonces destaco que otro importante componente de promover los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible y de, y de eh, promoverlos localmente eh, fue el desarrollo de dos actividades que vamos a estar llevando a cabo todos los años. Eh, la primera es la semana de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible en el mes de septiembre y la otra, la, se, la actividad eh, Meta Global es 100 por 35 en Casa Bacardi. Ya las hemos llevado en dos ocasiones. Eh, primero, la primera la hicimos en colaboración, una vez más, destacando las colaboraciones, la importancia de estas colaboraciones. Lo hicimos con el Exploratorio, el Museo de Ciencias de Puerto Rico, y preparamos todo un line-up eh, durante toda la semana de presentaciones pertinentes eh, sobre los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Importante destacar que más de 60.000 personas han visto los videos que se presentaron esa semana. Y es importante destacar cómo esa pandemia, ese, ese, ese Zoom Connection que nos hablaba el profesor Sachs, que ahora todos somos expertos o por lo menos no estamos reacios a utilizar la tecnología, cómo también nos puede ayudar en esta gran gesta de dar a conocer los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible en Puerto Rico. Este es el banner en Casa Bacardí, que estamos colaborando con la compañía porque es una compañía que está bien envuelta, bien comprometida con los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible alrededor del mundo y tiene un gran impacto en Puerto Rico, una gran huella. Aquí está la destilería de ron más grande de nuestro planeta. O sea que era importante para nosotros empezar esas colaboraciones con el sector privado y que nos ayudaran en, en, en promover estos ODS en Puerto Rico. Como estábamos destacando en la presentación de SACS, los estudiantes de ustedes en las universidades están locos porque ustedes lo, lo, los apoderen y los ayuden a promover estos objetivos de desarrollo sostenible en Puerto Rico. Y tengo que destacar dos de los miembros del grupo de trabajo, que son eh, grupos de jóvenes 
Enactus y JCI Puerto Rico, quienes están precisamente, mira lo que Enactus ha hecho recientemente, unos retos, unos retos con los objetivos, se llaman 17 metas, un propósito, y han hecho un llamado específico para la juventud en Puerto Rico para que se envuelvan en estos diferentes retos relacionados con los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Pero es como decía el profesor Sachs, más allá de un curso curricular es acción. Estamos en la década de acción de 2021 a 2030, o sea que dejarles saber, y sigo, que, que, que no están solos en esta gesta en Puerto Rico, que ya se han eh, dado unos pasos importantes y que lo importante ahora es continuarlo. Eh, JCI Puerto Rico pues creó su propia academia sobre los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible y no solamente en Puerto Rico, han envuelto toda la red de JCI Puerto Rico, de JCI en todas partes del mundo. También otra cosa importante para la promoción e integración de los ODS en Puerto Rico a través de la, de la educación para desarrollo sostenible, para nosotros va a ser el promover un gran salón natural que tenemos en, el, en, el, en nuestro bosque nacional, el Yunque, y es el, el centro de visitantes, el portal en el Yunque, y también el SDG Academy de Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Déjenme dejarles saber, porque ustedes conocen quizás que desde los huracanes eh, ha, se ha puesto en marcha un proyecto para la revi revitalización del centro de visitantes del portal de Yunque a casi 20 millones de dólares que se están envolviendo en este proyecto y, y verdaderamente nos honra que US Forest Service es parte del grupo de trabajo pero que nos invitó desde el saque a la, a la, a la primera visita en campo eh, sobre los diseños y sobre el proceso que se va a hacer en este portal y una de las cosas que nos honra estar colaborando con ellos es insertar un panel sobre los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, pero también otra, otra cosa que muy pocos puertorriqueños conocen es que el bosque, nuestro bosque nacional de Yunque forma parte del programa del hombre y la biosfera de la UNESCO, Man and the Biosphere Program. O sea que eso es algo que se va a destacar eh, también en ese panel y, y nos honra ser parte del mismo. Y... Como estaba mencionando ahorita, él no tuvo la oportunidad de destacar que el Sustainable Development Solutions Network ha desarrollado una, una, una gran universidad global que toda la facultad de ustedes y ustedes mismos eh, pueden entrar y es precisamente eh, Free Open Educational Sources de, lo, de los más grandes expertos en el planeta en desarrollo sostenible. Es importante destacar también que una de las publicaciones disponibles es el Laudato Si, que él estaba mencionando, del Papa Francisco, es uno de los cursos disponibles. O sea que, imagínense, no tenemos que re reinventar la rueda para que en Puerto Rico todos conozcamos sobre desarrollo sostenible y particularmente que nos podamos enfocar en aquellos ODS eh, que nos interesan a nosotros eh, y a su facultad y a sus estudiantes y a ustedes personalmente. También, otra iniciativa importante es cómo integrar el sector privado. Como estaba mencionando Mar y algunos de, de ustedes durante, durante sus preguntas y comentarios. Y precisamente, pues, eh, dimos los primeros pasos en esta dirección en el 2019 eh, con una colaboración con el Pacto Global de Naciones Unidas. El Pacto Global es la red de negocios de empresas más grande del mundo, con más de 10.000 compañías comprometidas con avanzar eh, los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible en el mundo. Y comenzamos con una actividad por invitación de Invest Puerto Rico y también Álvarez Díaz Villalón, la firma de arquitectos que, que son parte del Pacto Global de Naciones Unidas y nos exhortaron a invitar a Adam Gordon, que es la persona que está aquí, a dar una presentación durante esa, ese evento en el Centro de Convenciones en Puerto Rico. Como ven, en su presentación, SDGs for a Post María Puerto Rico, eh, muy pertinente, y precisamente compartió con todos los presentes cómo esto es un gran eh, framework, un gran marco para, para negocios responsables basado en declaraciones y convenciones de Naciones Unidas, que eso es lo que está detrás de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. También otra parte bien importante es financiamiento de estos objetivos de desarrollo sostenible en Puerto Rico. Más allá de la, de la monumental tarea 
que tiene el honorable Larry Selhammer a, tra a través del de Consejo de Reconstrucción de Puerto Rico, pues más allá que eso, hay socios colaboradores en el grupo de trabajo como Kiva, Causa Local y como Filantropía Puerto Rico, que han sido y serán instrumentales en este proceso también de financiamiento. Primero que nada, pues Causa Local está eh, 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 proveyendo acceso a capital a muchas empresas que quieren ser sostenibles desde su creación. Ellos ofrecen préstamos de hasta 15 mil dólares con 0% de interés y lo han hecho a más de 200 eh, eh, empresas en Puerto Rico. Y lo más interesante es que estas empresas, desde que se están creando, ya incorporan los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible porque saben lo que todos nosotros debemos entender eh, claramente. Y es que los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible nos ofrecen un lenguaje común, pero también una, un propósito común que deberíamos todos ad adoptar en Puerto Rico. Esto no es un proyecto de ninguna organización. Esto es un proyecto global. O sea que me llena de honra ver cómo estos negocios ya empiezan e incorporan en sus artes y su mercadeo los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Estas son las caras de Nuevo Puerto Rico. Estos son los jóvenes que estábamos hablando anteriormente. Mírenlos en la acción, mírenlos cómo crean estas compañías, estas empresas que ya son, son sostenibles. Y para darles un ejemplo bien claro, déjenme decirles que enviamos una, uno, unos eh, detalles de agradecimiento al profesor Sachs, precisamente a, a, a su casa de Nueva York, y son todos productos eh, sostenibles hechos en Puerto Rico, a través de una compañía que se llama Produce. Y Produce, pues yo pude haber ido a diferentes sitios para eh, comprarle ese regalo, ese reconocimiento a Sachs, pero queríamos obviamente que fueran productos sostenibles y esto es algo que todos los puertorriqueños debemos hacer. Y en el caso de filantropía, es bien importante también cómo la, eh, nos damos cuenta que la filantropía a nivel global, desde las más grandes organizaciones como Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, muchos de los cuales están interesados en hacer inversiones en el mundo académico, están pidiendo que las propuestas estén alineadas a los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. O sea que agradecimos de gran manera, de sobremanera, esa invitación que nos hiciera Filantropía eh, Puerto Rico. Y, y, by the way, fueron los que nos enviaron también un detalle tan especial de Produce que nos hicieron a nosotros eh, eh, querer hacer lo propio y continuar apoyando compañías locales sostenibles con productos hechos en Puerto Rico. Finalmente, el avanzar los ODS, tanto en Puerto Rico como en el exterior, nos corresponde a todos. Y estábamos hablando eh, anteriormente, y, y por eso destaco a, a Albi y a Luis Alberto Ferrer, por todos los artículos que ha escrito eh, relacionados con los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, pero también dejarles saber que hay unas redes, unos networks que es importante que ustedes se unan. O sea que el profesor Sachs no les destacó esto, pero yo aprovecho para así hacerlo. Hasta el momento... La Universidad de Puerto Rico y UNA USA Puerto Rico son los únicos miembros del Sustainable Development Solutions Network que él dirige. Y precisamente su staff me, me destacó que por favor les dejara saber a ustedes que están abiertas las convocatorias ahora de marzo a junio. O sea que exhorto a cada una de las universidades que se cuenta presente en esta actividad a que se unan a este gran network, a, este gran, a esta gran red global, que como dijo él, está compuesta por 35 eh, hosts nacionales, tiene 12 regionales y casi 